Hello, listeners. I'm your host, Amara, and this is Black Girl Gone, a true crime podcast. On this episode of Black Girl Gone, I tell the story of Crystal Taylor, who was 27 years old when she was murdered in Hawthorne, California on September 25th, 2001. At the time, Crystal was five months pregnant, but she had been having issues with the father of her unborn child who wanted her to abort the baby. Crystal, however, made the decision to keep her baby. The day that she was murdered, Crystal was leaving her apartment to go to work when someone walked up behind her and shot her. Both Crystal and her unborn child died. Despite a suspect early on, it would take 16 years for her family to get justice. This is Crystal's story. So here's a heartbreaking statistic. The leading cause of death for pregnant women in the United States is homicide. Women who are pregnant or recently gave birth are 16% more likely to be murdered than non-pregnant women. When I first heard this statistic last year, I was really shocked. I'm sure most people do not know this. We all know that pregnancy itself comes with its own set of complications, A lot of people are aware of the mortality rate amongst pregnant women, especially Black women, who are far more likely to die from childbirth-related complications than other women. But death from homicide for pregnant women is more prevalent than hypertensive disorders, hemorrhage, or sepsis. To know that homicide is the leading cause of death for pregnant women is disturbing, and it's scary. And It made me think about all of the women whose stories that I've covered that were either pregnant or new moms when they were murdered or went missing. Kiara Coles, Latoya Figueroa, Akia Eggleston, Allie Gilmore, Natiz Johnson, Jasmine Robinson, and Sharika Adams were all pregnant when they were murdered or went missing. It's a heavy thing to have to think about, but it's an important conversation. When Crystal Taylor was brutally murdered, her family was determined to find her killer and bring them to justice. And although it took 16 years for them to get that justice, they never gave up. In 2001, Crystal Taylor was a young mother preparing for a new chapter in her life, a new baby. She was born on January 14, 1974, and she was the youngest of three girls. Growing up, Crystal, who was affectionately known as Chrissy by her family, was very close to her sisters. Her family was interviewed by Dateline back in 2017, and in that interview, her sister said that they were best friends growing up. They did everything together. They joked that because Crystal was the baby, their mom always gave her that extra attention. You can tell by the way that the sisters talk about their life growing up that They were really happy, and they had a really good life. As they got older, they stayed close to each other and became each other's support system. When Crystal was 17, she gave birth to a son, and despite her being a young mom, her family says that they were excited to have a new baby in their family. Her sisters also had babies young, and so they all knew how important it was to support Crystal in this new chapter in her life. And even though she was now a young mom, finishing school was still the priority. And so with the support of her family and her own determination, Crystal finished school and began working. Her family says that she was happy with the life that she had created. Things weren't perfect. I mean, they never really are. But at the time, she was happy and she was young and had plenty of time to achieve all of her goals. 
By 2001, Crystal and her sisters were all living in the city of Hawthorne, California. They had all moved into the same apartment complex, and her mom was also staying there. According to her family, Crystal was a responsible young woman who made sure that her son was her priority. Now, the relationship with his father didn't work out, and so Crystal had moved on with her life and had been dating other people. Her family said that Crystal was always a hopeless romantic. She wanted a fairy tale type of love, and she wanted to get married. At some point, she had begun dating a man named Dino, but according to her family, the relationship was on again, off again. I mean, by all accounts, he was a nice guy, but you know how relationships can be. But in April 2001, Crystal met a man named Derek Sawyer. They had met at a park one day, and not long after, they began a relationship. They would meet at the park and eat lunch together, and Crystal had even introduced him to her co-workers, who joined her a few times for lunch. The relationship, however, only lasted for about a month or two. But in June 2001, Crystal found out that she was pregnant with Derek's baby. And even though she barely knew Derek and they were no longer together, Crystal had made the decision to keep her baby. No matter what, she always had her family there to support her. And so she was going to have the baby. According to court documents, Crystal waited before she told Derek that she was pregnant. I mean, maybe she was afraid of his reaction, but either way, on July 23rd, 2001, she decided that it was time for him to know. And so while she was at work that day, she asked her coworker to help her tell him. She asked her to send Derek an email and tell him that she was pregnant. She also wanted to know if he had sickle cell, which is a blood disorder that you inherit from your parents. And so her coworker sent Derek the email. And when he got it, Derek called the coworker. And so she put him on speakerphone so Crystal and the other co-worker that was there could hear him. Now, according to them, Derek was not happy when he found out that Crystal was pregnant. In the call, Derek said something like this had happened in his last relationship and he didn't want it to happen again. And he begged Crystal's co-worker to convince her to get an abortion. But she told him that Crystal didn't want anything from him and that she was capable of raising the child by herself, and she didn't need his money. The conversation ended with him telling her coworker to keep him updated about what was going on. Now, even though Crystal hadn't known Derek that well, it must have been hard for her to hear him begging her coworker to convince her to have an abortion. Now, a few weeks later, in August 2001, according to her coworker. Crystal began exploring the option of maybe having an abortion. It's not clear what made her change her mind or if she had been communicating with Derek during that time, but her coworker accompanied her to an abortion clinic. However, when she got there, Crystal found out that she was too far along. But even more than that, Crystal really wanted to have her baby. And so at that point, even with everything going on and with all the uncertainty, one thing was clear. Crystal was going to have the baby. Now, after the visit to the clinic, Crystal and Derek met. He came over to her apartment, and they talked for several hours about the baby. But Derek was clear. He didn't want Crystal to have the baby, regardless of how she felt. In early September, Crystal confided in her sisters the issues that were going on with her and Derek and how he did not want her to have the baby. Crystal was understandably sad. She knew early on that Derek didn't want her to have the baby, but I'm sure at that point she was hoping that he would have come around by now and changed his mind. I mean, after all, he did already have two other children, but he didn't. and. Things between them were getting worse. Crystal's mom had left California 
when she had gotten sick, and she had gone to Texas where her sister-in-law, who was a nurse, lived, and she was going to be able to care for her. But on September 11th, Crystal's mom's health took a turn for the worse, and so her and her sisters went to Texas to check on her. Her sister told Dateline that Crystal stayed by her mom's side the whole time that they were there, but Crystal was also distracted. The day that she arrived, her aunt said that she overheard Crystal on the phone with someone she was calling D. Her aunt said that she was arguing with the person on the phone who she could hear yelling. She said she heard Crystal saying, quote, you can't threaten me, and saying that she was not going to get rid of her baby. Her aunt said that she told Crystal to hang up the phone, but an hour later, she heard her on the phone again talking to D. And this time, she could hear him too. And she said she heard the male voice say, no bitch tells me what to do. Again, her aunt told her to hang up the phone. And she said that when she did, Crystal was really upset and started to cry. Her aunt was really worried about her. I mean, what she overheard was disturbing. And she could tell that Crystal was really upset about it. She said that the next day, She took Crystal's phone when she again heard her arguing with Dee. She said that she was concerned about this relationship that her niece was having, and so she tried to convince her and her sister to move to Texas. She said she even showed them some houses that they could move into. But after several days in Texas, Crystal's mom began to get better, and so they made plans to return to California. Crystal was scheduled to be back at work on September 24th, and Derek had found out from her coworkers that she would be back that day. And so on her first day back at work, he called her. Now, it's not clear what he said to her during that conversation, but whatever it was, it upset Crystal. And when they hung up, she started crying. Crystal was now five months pregnant, and the relationship with Derek was just getting worse. Instead of just accepting what was happening, Derek was angry. Everyone around Crystal was witnessing what was going on and what she was going through, and I'm sure it was hard for them to watch her deal with something like this. Being pregnant should be a happy time, but When the father of your child is pressuring you to abort your child or threatening you, it's impossible to have a peaceful, happy pregnancy. And sadly, Crystal would never get the chance to enjoy her pregnancy. Because less than 24 hours after she had that conversation with Derek at work, Crystal was dead. In September 2001, 27-year-old Crystal Taylor was five months pregnant, and although she wanted to keep her baby, the father of her unborn child, Derek Sawyer, wanted her to get rid of it. For months, he had been asking her to get an abortion, but she refused, and their arguments were becoming more intense. Crystal was determined to have her child, but sadly, she would never get the chance. On September 25th, 2001, Crystal woke up and got ready for work like she normally did. Her sister Michelle would pick up Crystal's son and take him to school along with her own children around 6 a.m., and then Crystal would usually leave after that to head to work. But that day, shortly before 7.30 a.m., police received calls for sounds of gunfire at the apartment building where Crystal and her sisters lived. When police arrived at around 7.34 a.m., they found Crystal. She had been shot in the head. She was lying on the ground in the doorway of the carport. By the time police arrived, it was too late. Crystal and her unborn child were dead. 
It was a disturbing scene, and the police had no idea what happened to this young woman. Robbery was quickly ruled out, however, because her purse and keys were located on her. Someone had ambushed her, shot her while she was walking to her car. But the question was, why? At the time, the detectives had no idea that Crystal was pregnant, and so they didn't know about Derek. But it didn't take them long to find out all about him. Now, after detectives arrived at the scene and positively identified Crystal, they began their investigation into who she was and why someone would want to kill her. They determined where she worked, and so they went there to talk to her co-workers and see what they could find out. Now, once there, they spoke to several people, including the two women who she was friends with and who she had been confiding in about her issues with Derek. And so after speaking to them, they also found out that Crystal was actually pregnant, but that the father of her child wasn't happy about it. They told them that his name was Derek Sawyer, and they told the detectives where he worked. Now, once they found out about Derek, he became almost immediately a person of interest. So far, it looked as if Crystal was just a normal girl living a quiet life, and she wasn't robbed. So, more likely than not, whoever killed Crystal was someone who she had some sort of relationship with. After speaking to detectives... One of the co-workers agreed to ride with them to Derek's job so that she could help identify him. But once they got there, they found out that Derek wasn't at work. The co-worker had mentioned that Crystal and Derek would often meet at Anderson Park for lunch, and so they decided to head over there to see if he was there. And when they arrived at the park, the co-worker saw Derek's car, which was a silver Mustang that had vanity plates. And a few feet away, she saw Derek standing there talking to someone. Detectives approached Derek, and he was detained and taken into the police station for questioning. When police spoke to Derek, he denied any involvement in Crystal's murder. He told the detectives that they did have a brief relationship, and he acknowledged that she was pregnant. However, he never said that the baby was his, nor did he tell them about his campaign to get Crystal to abort the baby. He did, however, mention that he believed Crystal was seeing other people. After speaking to Derek, police searched his car and his apartment, but they didn't find any evidence linking him to the shooting. They also checked his alibi and confirmed that Derek had been at work at the time of the shooting. They were suspicious of Derek from the start, but without any evidence, they had a hard time connecting him to the murder. They also had to rule out other people, and so they spoke to her ex, Dino, and her son's father. But they too had alibis, and they had no motive to kill Crystal. and so they were also ruled out as suspects. Early on in the investigation, when they spoke to Michelle, Crystal's sister, they learned that the day before the shooting, she saw a strange man wearing a hoodie and a bandana lurking around the apartment building. Michelle told the detectives that she spoke to the man, but that there was something really suspicious about him. And so... Michelle said that she had called Crystal to tell her to be careful. On September 27th, Michelle sat down with a sketch artist so that she could help them come up with a composite sketch of the man that she had seen that day. After speaking to several other people that lived in the apartment building, at least two other people also saw the man wearing the hoodie and the bandana the day before the murder. Now, police were not sure if this person was connected to the murder, but they wanted to find him anyway. A few days later, police received their first big lead in the case. A tip came in stating that Crystal had been killed by a gang member. 
The tipster said that Crystal had been killed by a man who went by the street name Little C. Styles, but whose real name was Skylar Moore. He was apparently a member of the Crips. And when police showed his picture to Michelle, she positively ID'd him as the man that she saw on the 24th wearing the hoodie and the bandana. They also showed his picture to other witnesses who also identified Skylar Moore as the man that they had seen that day. In November 2001, Skylar Moore was interviewed by police and he denied being involved in Crystal's murder. He said that he did not know her and he told police that he had seen the police activity outside her apartment that day, but he had nothing to do with what happened and that he was only walking by because he was taking his younger brother and sister to school. But he continued to maintain his innocence. Police ended up executing searches on Skylar's home, and inside, they found several bandanas, including ones matching the description from the witnesses. They also found gang writings and a 38 caliber unfired bullet. Crystal had been killed by a 38. Now, between the witnesses picking him out of a phono lineup and the evidence that they had found in his home, detectives felt like they had enough to charge Skylar Moore with murder. The evidence, however, was circumstantial, but detectives felt like they had enough to prove that Skylar Moore was responsible for the murder. However, during the preliminary hearing, Court documents state that witnesses were either reluctant to testify or evasive. I mean, when gangs are involved, people become less likely to testify out of fear of retaliation. I mean, at that point, they had no motive, and so it looked like it might have been a random murder, maybe even a gang initiation. And so the witnesses were rightly afraid. Only Michelle and one other witness who was a child were able to identify more during that hearing. And it wasn't enough for the prosecutors, and the charges were ultimately dropped. Moore, however, while police were interviewing him, out of the blue, confessed to another murder, the shooting death of a rival gang member. And so he was charged with that murder and eventually convicted. And so even though they couldn't get him for Crystal's murder at that time, they at least knew where he was. After Crystal's murder, police followed every lead, and at first, it looked as if they would be able to solve this murder quickly. But at that time, Skylar Moore was their best suspect, and they did not have enough evidence to prove that he was their killer. Detectives figured that they would just wait. They were pretty sure that Skylar Moore was their trigger man, and so they figured that eventually, they would get more evidence and they would be able to refile the charges against him. But weeks turned to months and detectives were not finding the evidence they needed to prove Moore's involvement. Crystal's murder, as you can imagine, nearly destroyed her close-knit family. Her son was 10 at the time and his loss was immeasurable. Her family struggled after her murder, and the fact that no one had been held accountable for what happened only made it worse. Six months after Crystal's murder, her mom died. And even though she had been sick, her daughters believed that it was ultimately the heartbreak that caused her death. Everyone, including Crystal's family, was convinced that Skylar Moore had killed her, but the one thing they could not figure out was why. Was it really just a random murder? Or was there some other connection between Crystal and Skylar? As the years went by, her sisters were determined to unravel this mystery and find Crystal's killer. But what about Derek? Well, her sisters never forgot about him. They remembered that he didn't want the baby that Crystal was carrying, and they wondered if he was really the reason she was dead. As the years went on, they thought about Derek a lot. 
They even tracked him down and found out that he had gotten his bachelor's degree and started his own company. He was living a happy, carefree life. Crystal's sister said that they remember how unfair it felt that he was just happily living his life while their sister was dead. And as time went on, they became more and more convinced that Derek was the reason why. For almost 10 years, they waited for justice, but it started to feel like it would never come. By then, Crystal's case had gone cold, and police had no new leads to follow. For that entire time, Skylar Moore had sat in prison, but he had never said anything about Crystal's murder. And even though the case was cold, it remained open. And in June 2011, detectives decided that they would go visit Skylar Moore and see if he was ready to talk. Like her sisters, they too believed that Derek had something to do with Crystal's murder. And after 10 years in prison, maybe Skylar was ready to talk. According to Dateline, detectives had spoken to some gang members that were locked up with Moore, and they told them that he had a lot of enemies in prison. At the time, he was in solitary confinement, and so detectives were going to use what they had learned as leverage to try and get Moore to talk. If he had enemies in prison, he might want to move out of California to a different prison where no one knew him to serve out the remainder of his time. Now, they had no idea if he would take the deal, but they knew that after 10 years, it was worth a shot. On June 15th, 2011, two detectives from the L.A. Sheriff's Office went to visit Skylar Moore in prison. And at first, he didn't say much, but detectives continued to question him, and they even showed him pictures of Derek and Crystal. And eventually... Skylar Moore waived his Miranda rights and began to talk. He told detectives that he did know Derek Sawyer, that they had met at Anderson Park when they were both playing basketball there. Moore also sold drugs at the park, and court documents state that Moore told detectives that he had been trying to recruit Derek into the gang so that he could help him sell drugs there, but it's not clear if that ever happened. However, Moore said that in September 2001, Derek began complaining to him about Crystal. Moore said that Derek told him that the baby wasn't his and that she was just trying to trap him. He then asked Moore if he would, quote unquote, remove her or, quote unquote, knock her down. Moore said that he told Derek that it was no problem at all, and he was willing to do it. He said Derek then gave him Crystal's address along with her description. He also told him what time she typically left her house to go to work. He told the detectives that Derek and him had spoken about killing Crystal at least twice. Moore then confessed that he had gone to Crystal's apartment three times to try to kill her, but each time something happened and he was unable to follow through. But on September 24th, he told the detectives that he jogged over to Crystal's apartment, which wasn't far from where he lived, so that he could quote-unquote map out the murder. He then waited in the hallway for Crystal to come down the steps, and then he shot her in the back of the head. He then told detectives that a few days later, he met Derek again, but that Derek didn't seem happy about the murder. Moore said that Derek was nervous and that he started to think that Derek was going to go to the police. His suspicion deepened when Derek began to avoid him, and so Moore told the detectives that he planned to kill Derek too, but that he was arrested before he could. When he was asked why he had finally decided to tell the truth, he said that he wasn't affiliated with the gang anymore and that he was trying to make amends for all the bad things that he had done. Finally, detectives had what they needed to arrest Derek. 
And so shortly after that conversation with Skylar Moore, Derek Sawyer was arrested. When police spoke to him, again, he denied any involvement in Crystal's murder. And he denied that he had hired Skylar Moore to kill her. But this time, police had what they would need to charge him with her murder. And her co-worker had identified Moore as being the person that Derek was talking to at Anderson Park the day after the murder. Detectives had always believed that Derek was involved, and so while he awaited trial, they made sure that they had enough of a case to convict him. After he was arrested, police discovered that the mother of his older two children had been attacked while she was pregnant with both of his children. Both times his ex was attacked, she was far along in her pregnancies. In the first attack, she said that Derek had told her to meet him in an alleyway so that they could go to the doctor. But as she waited, she was attacked by a man with a knife. He put the knife to her throat, which cut her. But she was ultimately able to fight him off and get away. In 2002, detectives learned that Derek's ex said that when she was pregnant a second time with his child, that Derek was trying to make the baby, quote-unquote, go away. She said that he had put his hands over her mouth and that he had threatened to kill the baby. After that incident, she said that one day, Derek was calling her repeatedly, trying to find out her location. She told him that she was at her aunt's house and that she was on her way back to her grandmother's house where she lived. But when she arrived back at her grandmother's house, a man attacked her. He punched her in the face, and then he repeatedly kicked her in her stomach and her face. Both times that she was attacked, she confided to someone that she believed that Derek was involved. And during both pregnancies, he had asked her to get an abortion. According to police, the only time his ex was ever attacked was when she was pregnant. By the time the trial began, prosecutors were sure that they had enough evidence to show that Derek Sawyer had hired Skylar Moore to kill Crystal because he didn't want to be a father again. They planned to use Skylar's confession, the witnesses' accounts, and the evidence that they had discovered to paint a clear picture of who Derek Sawyer really was. But when the trial began, their main witness, Skylar Moore, changed his story. He said that he had lied to detectives when he told them that Derek Sawyer hired him to kill Crystal. He said that he only confessed because he wanted to get a deal from the detectives. The defense presented a case that put into question the idea that this was a murder for hire, and ultimately, the jury was unable to reach a verdict, and a mistrial was declared. Prosecutors, however, were not deterred, and they planned to try the case again. And they did. This time, they would put Derek and Moore on trial together. In the second trial, Derek's own daughter testified against him. She told them that Derek hated being a father. She said that everything he did was for show, and that he was only nice when people were around. Otherwise, he was a monster. Michelle and Crystal's co-worker also testified in the second trial. Derek himself this time decided that he wanted to testify in his own defense. He believed that he would be able to convince the jury of his innocence. He told them that he was a loving father and denied having anything to do with the attacks on his ex while she was pregnant. He also denied knowing Skylar Moore and said that before this case, he had never seen him before in his life. Derek tried his best to prove to the jury that he was incapable of murder and that it was all just a big misunderstanding, but the jury did not believe him. It took them less than a day of deliberation, and they found Derek Sawyer guilty. On June 1st, 2017, he was sentenced to life in prison 
without the possibility of parole. Moore, his accomplice, and Trigger Man was also given an additional life sentence. After 16 long years, Crystal's family finally received justice. When Crystal made the decision to have her baby, she had no idea that she would be murdered for it. The situation with Derek wasn't ideal, but she was willing to do it with or without him. She was only 27 years old, and within a year of meeting Derek Sawyer, she was dead. Her family lost her and her unborn son that day. Her son, who was 10 at the time, lost his mom and little brother to a senseless act of violence, and he has had to live with the scars of that loss his entire life. Derek Sawyer did appeal his conviction, but it was upheld, and so he remains in prison. So many stories like Crystal's exist. So many before her, and so many after her. I'm happy that her family was finally able to get justice, and I hope that it helped them in some way. May Crystal Taylor rest in peace. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. We'll be back next week with a brand new story. In the meantime, make sure you follow us on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and Twitter.